author and intellectual poet. It is, it might be added that he is certainly the type of engaging intellectual in the verse of Tellhouse, where he is considered a literature mainly as a species of action. The corpus of his poetry is a speculative monolith. Poetry was for him, among other things, an instrument for bringing to better the thought of history as well as some of the history of thought upon the problems of a rich and turbulent present. And in his poetry, we find knowledge, speculation, Best with the intensity of direct sensual experience, it can be hard to say that whether speculative or practical music played a more fundamental role in the thoughts and commitments of, or even the, of the young Milton. Much has been written of his musical background, training, and interests. Even more attention has been paid to the rich profusion of musical reference, both speculative and practical, in the body of his work. From the oratorical exercise of his school days on the music of the spheres, the sparayum concentro. From the rhetorical exercise of his school days on the music of the spheres, the sparayum Concentu through the many passages of practical and theoretical musical illusion in Paradise Lost. Hmm. Milton was vast. Milton's vast knowledge of both the secular music of his own day and the classical and Christian musical doctrine of, is amply revealed. Critics of the past 35 years have demonstrated the extent of that Revelation. Attention has been paid primarily to the more expository treatments of Christian musical doctrine in Milton's poetry, such as The Morning of Christ's Nativity, Arcades, and the many sections on The Music of Heaven in Paradise Lost. Do you think that there is a lot of music in heaven, huh? Music of heaven. He goes it all. <laughs> he seems to think so. <laughs> it is certainly true that the greater number of such treatments and references manifest that receive Christian humanist interest in the ethical implications of the heavenly music. In the notion that since the fall, human imperfection rather than thresholds of hearing our custom have rendered the music inaudible. What happened to it? That's why he would be paid. Why did it become inaudible? Was it too bad? Some people are still here. Uh, hmm. And that's why he may be paid also. It seems he's, he did a, he wrote uh, something just as a student. In his school days, he wrote the music of the spheres. Uh -huh. Well, Milton's use of music to mean poetry in pastoral context is almost a truism. It is, has not been pointed out that Milton was able to absorb as well some of the Baroque doctrines about the rhetorical nature of music, a passage like that in Book Four of Paradise Lost, in which we Learn that heavenly music is indeed audible in heaven. Seems like it's audible in heaven. Actually, if you reach the, you actually have to reach the, the third eye, or you have to reach the point for it to be audible. You have to withdraw largely from the body. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can still hear it, but uh, heavenly music is indeed audible in heaven. Well, according to Milton and many other experts, with heavenly's touch of instrumental sounds uh, in full harmony, Nick Number joined. Uh, Milton says, with heavenly, heavenly touch of instrumental sounds in full harmony, number joined, is often co commented on with 
reference to Milton's use of traditional musical lore, for example. But in the demonic book games in book two, the poetry and music rhetoric nexus comes up in a rather new way after the military and athletic contests among the fiends of hell have been described. We are told that. Others more mild retreated in a silent valley sing with notes angelical to many a harp their own heroic deeds and hapless fall by doom of battle and complain that fate free virtue sell and thrall to force or chance that our song was partial. But the harmony, what could it less when spirits of mortals sing suspended out and took with ravishment the thronging audience in discourse more sweet for eloquence the soul song charms the sense others apart sat on a hill retired in thoughts more elevate and reasoned high of providence foreknowledge will and fate fixed fate free will foreknowledge absolute and found no end in wandering mazes lost uh -huh. goodness no matter what the perverse import of the text of the devil's epic song, the melody itself, partaking of the potency of the heavenly music, remains strongly effective. The notions of word and note are separated here and now. It is the doctrine which has suffered in the fate of the rebel angels rather than the purely musical power to charm and move, but Milton carefully stipulates that it is the soul itself that is affected by the rational powers of eloquence. So while, quote, song charms the sense, unquote, alone and cannot, no matter how attractive, actually operate upon the highest psychic faculties, the philosophical discussions that are next described, although graceless, vacant, quest for the self-knowledge to which the fiends can never attain must be discourse more sweet, harmonious, and well attuned. The distinction between eloquence and song is certainly a step towards the later 17th century bifurcation of the functions of language and music. It would be noticed that the passage moves from epic music, poetry of the games in hell, to the musical skill retained by the fallen angels to the contrast between the music and even poetry music, the actual doctrine, and the fiends can sing the wrong words to the marvelous melodies of angelic music is just another oddity of their utterly paradoxical predicament. Uh, well, nowhere in Milton, perhaps, are the effective properties of music used in a more complicated metaphorical fabric than in Camus. Even the passage from Paradise Lost, mentioned above, is primarily expository in its use of musica speculata, or of changes rung unto it by the exigencies of the poem's philosophical schema. But in Camus, the intricate combination of actual and theoretical music resonates far beyond the conventional play of maskers of identities represented by the casting of Henry Laws. The mass composer, as the attendant spirit, the Thyrus Pan Orpheus figure in the first place of the lady's song. One of a sparse five in a long, extravagant entertainment, while serving as the primary instrument in the action of the mask itself, is for self referential in two senses. It addresses itself to its own resonating effects. It's echoes here, personified the myth of Echo herself, not only a favorite pastoral figure, but a favorite metaphor for the relationship of actual human music to the heavenly harmony. On the one hand and on the other, it covertly refers to the lady herself in her own predicament. 
The love-worn nightingale is taken up by the disguised attendant spirit's comments. Uh, is there an echo? The nymph echo. Uh -huh. Maybe the the heavenly human music and the heavenly music is just an echo. <laughs> echo. And poor hapless nightingale thought I, how sweet that sings, in the second place from. From the late opening remarks to, on the riot and ill-managed uh, measurement of Camus' dance, and on the fact that it is her ear which must be her best guide now to the final invocation of this very chime. As the summit of the purely material world, surmounted by the influences of virtue, musical figures of several sorts are employed. It is primarily the lady song that generates most of these intercasses. Here's the poem. A song. Sweet echo, sweetest nymph that liveth unseen within the airy shell by slow meanders merchant green in the violet. Embroidered veil, where the love lorn nightingale, nightly to thee her sad song mourneth well. Canst thou not tell me of a gentle pair, that likest thy narcissus are? Oh, if thou have, hide them in some flowery cave. Tell me, but where, sweet queen of parley, daughter of the sphere, so must thou be translated to the skies. And give resounding grace to all heaven's harmonies. <laughs> the song, the song is a, is in some measure a hymn in the praise of music itself as actual melody. It is enchanting ravishment for Camus and in raptures that move the vocal air. Here, if anywhere in the course of the poem is the musical pun on air employed to enrich the terms of Camus' expression of wonder for the attendant spirit, it. Rose like a stream of rich distilled perfumes and stole upon the air that even silence was took air ere she was where and wished she might deny her nature and be nevermore. Still to be so displaced, I was all ear, and took in strains that might create a soul under the ribs of death. Uh -huh. Hmm. Ah, uh, interesting. Hmm. Rose like a stream of rich distilled perfumes, and stole upon the air that even silence was took ere here she was where and wish she might deny her nature and be nevermore still to be so displaced i was all ear and took in strains that might create a soul under the ribs of death uh -huh. we are reading milton milton uh, we are reading uh, something about the Milton's po poetry. Milton, we're reading Milton within the untuning of the sky. Ideas of music and English poetry. Three something. <laughs> what page is it? Three hundred something. <laughs> the exact page. Oh dear, I got three hundred. I got to stop. The page is three twenty-one. <laughs> mm -hmm. 